for every water utility professional, understanding the proper methodology of sizing, selecting, and installing water meters for your commercial and industrial applications is extremely important to assure that the right revenues are collected. In part six of this series, we're going to take a closer look at compound metering technology. Let's dive into it. In today's lesson about compound meters, we're going to cover three things, how they work, review their typical operating ranges, and then look at seven distinct metering characteristics and see how they apply to the compound meters. To start off, think about what a compound meter is. It's what the word says. It's a compound. It's, the, it's two different things combined into one. You actually have a meter that has a positive displacement nutating disc portion for the low flow action. And then you have a turbine meter also, the best of both worlds here. Let's watch a quick video here to see exactly how this particular meter works. Water flows directly into the single compound meter housing. If the water is flowing through the meter in a low flow condition, the flow of water is directed through a bypass into a chamber assembly. Inside the chamber assembly is a movable disc that's located on a sliding ball guided by a thrust roller. As the water flows into the measuring chamber, it causes the disc to nutate, a motion similar to a coin dropped on a table. Notice that the disc does not rotate, but rather wobbles on its axis. Therefore, the space formed between the disc and the chamber wall has a constant volume as it moves around the chamber. The water in the chamber is a fixed volume, or displacement. That's why a disc meter is called a positive displacement meter. The smooth motion of the disc also eliminates the annoying noise produced by some other types of positive displacement meters. As this happens, the nutating disc translates its movement through a magnetic coupling to the register. The water flows into the rear of the meter's housing, where the valve assembly resides, and then exits through the outlet. Water flows directly into the single compound meter housing. If the water is flowing through the meter in a high flow condition, the pressure differential causes the spring-loaded valve assembly to open. It flows past the straightening vanes at the entrance to the measuring element, helping to condition the water flow. As the water flows into the element, it comes in contact with the rotor, which lifts into its floating position and begins to spin. A right angle worm gear couples the rotor to a vertical spindle, which in turn drives a gear set that rotates a coupled magnet on the wet side of the meter. The rotor's revolutions are therefore transmitted via this coupling through the cover plate to the register. Finally, the water flows into the downstream side of the meter's housing, where the valve assembly resides. The water then exits through the outlet. It's important to note that in a high flow condition, a portion of the water still flows through the disc chamber before exiting the meter. Well, hopefully that quick video actually was a good representation of exactly how that meter works so you have a better understanding of the function of a compound meter. Now let's talk about the operating ranges and the sizes of these meters. Typically, compound meters don't come in all sizes. They typically come in two, three, four, six, and eight inch sizes. So someone might ask, why does this meter not come in a, a 12 inch or a 14 or 16 inch? When you need a 14 inch line, normally the customer is going to be using large volumes of water. They're not going to have an application where they're needing very small flows. Now that's not always true, but typically that's why you see compound meters in these particular sizes. Well, let's take a look at these particular meters and let's, let's review, let's say a two inch meter. In the case of a two inch meter, there I have the equivalent of a five eighths inch positive displacement nutating disc meter, right? That same chamber that's in that five eighths residential size meter is in this two inch compound. And then the corresponding two inch turbine element is in this, this meter. So when I look at the operating range, I can read plus or minus a percent and a half all the way down to a half gallon per minute 
and then all the way up to 200 gallons per minute. The maximum continuous duty is pretty close to the high side of this meter, but it's at 170 gallons per minute. Remember, that's taking a look at the application of where it could run 24-7, seven, seven days a week. You're not prematurely wear out this meter. When we look at the extended low flow of the two inch compound, it can read down to a quarter of a gallon per minute at 95% accuracy. So this meter is pretty accurate across a large flow range. If we look at one of the larger meters, the four inch size meter, again, this has the equivalent of a three quarter inch positive displacement nutating disc as the disc portion, as the low flow portion. So I can read down to three quarters of a gallon per minute, but on the high side, having a four inch turbine element, I can read all the way up to a thousand gallons per minute. Pretty wide flow range here. Max continuous duty is at 800 gallons per minute. When we look at this four inch compound meter, because I have the equivalent of a three quarter inch meter doing the work on the low flow side, I can read down to three eighths of a gallon per minute at 95% accuracy. Now let's take a look at our seven characteristics and look at them as they correspond to a compound meter. We talked about this earlier. The measurement type here is it's a compound so it's the best of both worlds. I have a positive displacement nutating disc measuring the low flow side and then I have an inferential measurement on the turbine side of things. If I look at the flow range ratio meaning the ratio from high to low it's about 800 to 1 on that two inch compound, I can read down to a quarter of a gallon per minute on its extended low flow, and then all the way up to 200 gallons per minute. So that's an 800 to one ratio. When you compare that to a disc meter or a turbine meter, you can see because I have the ability to read very low to very high, that's a very wide flow range ratio. Low flow sensitivity, of course, is excellent because I'm reading that low flow side with the positive displacement nutating disc. The head loss is good. You are going to have a little bit more pressure loss with the valve actuation of this meter because I have to hold back the pressure and run the low flows through the positive displacement nutating disc. So it's good. It's just not excellent like a turbine meter would be. Maintenance periods, because this meter has more moving parts with this spring loaded valve actuation, you are going to have more maintenance period when you compare this to a turbine or a disc meter. When you compare the purchase price of a compound meter to a turbine meter, it's about twice the cost. Now you may say, well, that's a, that's a big expense there. Let's say I have an application where I have a turbine meter installed, but the customer uses low flows quite often as well. I may pay less for that meter, but I'm losing revenue because I'm not accurately measuring the low flows. What is this meter engineered for? This meter is engineered for ultra low flows as well as high flows, the best of both worlds. So hopefully with that explanation, you now have a better understanding of how a compound meter works, its typical operating ranges, and then looking at these characteristics really where you should start applying a compound meter. If you have any questions about today's topic, feel free to ask a question in the comment section below and I'll personally provide you with an answer or if you'd rather send a private message or have any questions related to metering or meter reading systems that I can help you with, be sure to connect with me on LinkedIn. Our question of the day, what other aspects of meter sizing, selection, and installation do you want to know more about? Please provide your question in the comment section below. Be one of the first 10 people to reply to be entered into our weekly Smart Water Show giveaway. If you found value in this content, be sure to click the like button. And if you have a colleague that would benefit from listening to this episode on sizing and selection, be sure to share it with them by clicking the share button. Stay tuned for part seven of this series where similarly to today, we'll examine electronic metering technology. We'd like to thank you for watching this video and we'll catch you next time on the Smart Water Show.